Inside the Magic, show number 427 for June 9th, 2013. It is Sunday, June 9th, 2013. This is show 427 of Inside the Magic. And as always, I'm your host, Ricky Briganti. We've got another great show packed with uh, all kinds of theme park fun and news and all that good stuff. And before we jump into all of it, I invite you to visit InsideTheMagic.net. That is our website where you can find all of our podcasts, videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And if you ever have any news, tips, questions, comments, anything else you want to send in, you can email me at Ricky at InsideTheMagic.net or you can call and leave a message at 407-494-4ITM. That's 4486. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of Inside the Magic is brought to you by Magical Travel. Walt Disney World offers to save you money all summer long to the fall are available now. Uh, travel from beginning just a few days from now, June 13th, all the way through September 28th, and you can save up to 30% at select Walt Disney World Resort hotels. There's also a free dining offer for Walt Disney World guests for arrivals most nights between September 2nd and September 25th. So you're going to want to call Magical Travel today for more information and for the best availability at 866-207-8387 or visit them online at MagicalTravel.com to receive a free price quote and be sure to mention inside the magic to receive that free disney gift card for qualifying bookings when you book your disney vacation with magical travel and of course thanks very much to uh, anybody who has contributed to inside the magic either a one-time donation or a recurring donation or clicking through uh, any of the uh, shopping links over on inside the magic.net it all supports the uh, the whole shebang here and uh, thank you for all of it now let's get started with a, a trip around the world <laughs> So, uh, we are uh, here. We're here. It's summer. It's the monstrous summer, indeed, at Walt Disney World and Disneyland. But more importantly, it's it's just summer. And that means uh, things are calming down a little bit, finally, after uh, literally uh, weeks, if not months, of constant uh, openings and events and big hoopla things going on. It's uh, actually kind of been a normal week for once in the world of theme parks here. Uh, it's, it's, you know, not a lot of news, just a little bit here and there, and I think we're actually going to have time to catch up on some listener feedback this week for once, but that doesn't mean I don't have some other fun stuff to share as well. Got a couple of interviews coming up in just a little bit. So, uh, before uh, getting to those, of course, let's do the news here. And first up, let's talk a little bit about limited time magic uh, coming up out here at Walt Disney World uh, over at Disney's Hollywood Studios beginning in a few days, June 14th, all running uh, essentially till the end of summer, uh, near the end of August, actually. It's going to be a Monsters University Homecoming. This is going to be a special party that's going to take place uh, each night during those dates I just mentioned uh, between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. at the big stage in front of the Sorcerer uh, Mickey hat. And uh, this Monsters University Homecoming is uh, going to feature, of course, it's for Monsters University, which is uh, coming out uh, very soon, just a couple of weeks from now in theaters. June uh, 21st is when it hits theaters. Uh, There's going to be a DJ, the Monster of Scaramonies. He'll be, you know, spinning plenty of uh, uh, songs over there. There's going to be Monsters University cheerleaders uh, having everybody do a Monsters University fight song. And then the Monsters of Rock, the Scare Supply. (laughs) will be there. I'm sure it's just going to be mulch, sweat, and shears uh, rethemed. But uh, they're good, so that's a good thing. Uh, there's going to be monstrous mashups, as Disney is putting it. And of course, Mike and Sully will be there as well. So that's uh, upcoming limited time magic out here in Orlando. Of course, talking about that monstrous summer, there is plenty of other Monsters University-related entertainment to be found not only out here at Walt Disney World, but also at Disneyland in California. At uh, Disney California Adventure, the Pixar Play Parade has a new Monsters University unit uh, featuring Mike and Sully and Roz and a few new scarers from Monsters University. And uh, there's also a nearby meet and greet with Mike and Sully with this really elaborate, great set uh, that looks like the Monsters University dorms. And uh, meanwhile, out here in Florida at Disney's Hollywood Studios, there is a uh, Monsters University student union set up as a meet and greet uh, there. 
So uh, no matter which coast you are on, you do have a chance to uh, to meet and greet with the uh, the scarers and get your photo with them and all that good stuff. Uh, actually, if you want to see what those look like, the parade unit as well as the meet and greets, head on over to InsideTheMagic.net. We've got some great video and uh, photos for you to uh, to check out of all of that. Now we're actually going to turn away from Disney here for a moment. Uh, while we're talking about summer entertainment over at Bush Gardens Tampa, they've announced the details of their Summer Nights festivities this year that have already begun, began yesterday, June 8th, continuing nightly through August 18th. There is a new act this year as part of Summer Nights called Born to Rock, featuring a live guitarist, belly dancers, and a top-notch circus, as they put it. Kind of an interesting combination of things there. There's also nightly fireworks, which, you know, in the world of Disney, that's not anything unusual, but for Bush Gardens it is. They don't normally run fireworks every single night, but for the summer they do. And uh, there will also be a variety of dance challenges throughout the park and some other entertainment as well. So that's all part of their summer nights. Now let's hop over to California for something, well, not really related to summer at all. In fact, it's already looking ahead to fall. Over at Universal Studios Hollywood, uh, related to Halloween Horror Nights, this year, first time ever, they are holding a design a character contest. This is really exciting. I, I think I'm going to have to enter this myself. Uh, the contest basically goes as follows. Pick one of the Universal Classic Monsters and kind of reimagine it. How would you bring that character to life at the event? And well, they'll do just that. They're going to pick a winner. And that winner's design is going to become a character at Halloween Horror Nights, only in California, not out here in Orlando. Uh, but that's pretty cool. Ever since the event has been around in California, there's really just been two guys essentially designing all of the characters out there. This is a very rare opportunity for somebody else to uh, design a character. In fact, the winner is uh, and a guest are going to be flown out there. You get tickets to go to opening night. You get to be part of the opening ceremonies. Uh, you know, walk down the red carpet and uh, the winner will be announced. The winning design uh, will be shown off that night. You'll get a, a couple of nights in a hotel. It's a, it's a big deal. And of course, the list of uh, monsters you can choose from to sort of reimagine in your own version are Dracula, Dracula's Bride, uh, Dracula's assistant, the Phantom in the Opera, the Mummy, the Wolfman, uh, Werewolf, like Werewolf of London, uh, uh, Igor slash Doctor Frankenstein's assistant, uh, Doctor Frankenstein himself, the Hunchback of uh, Notre Dame or Notre Dame, uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Invisible Man, and uh, and yeah, that's the end of the list. Um, there are actually two ways to enter this contest because they wanted it to be open or wanted to be open to everybody. They don't want it only for, you know, really talented designers. So you can, if you are great at drawing, uh, you can uh, create a uh, illustration showing what your character looks like and submit that. Or not so great at drawing, you can actually describe your character with a one page description uh, fitting some real specific uh, guidelines. Uh, head on over to InsideTheMagic.net for more details on this uh, contest. I should note it is open only to ages 18 and up, and uh, no Universal employees either, but uh, pretty exciting. I, I, can't, I really look forward to seeing uh, the finalists are actually going to be posted online. There's going to be voting to determine which one is the uh, going to be the winner, so uh, I, I'll, I'm, you know, maybe I'll design a character and throw that in there. I d certainly don't expect to win. I imagine uh, many other people have great creative ideas that I, uh, I can't wait to see what people come up with for that. Let's turn away uh, from theme parks here uh, over to Disney Cruise Line, where uh, this is kind of fun. Just a little bit of news here, where apparently uh, over in Jamaica, where Disney Cruise Line will soon be sailing, uh, they're adding Jamaican bobsledding as a new port adventure over there. And they put out a photo of this. It almost looks like a cross between a bobsled and a roller coaster. Um, I mean, I guess that's what a bobsled is. It's kind of like a roller coaster, but without the coaster. Anyway, it looks fun. Something that I will have to do someday. You know, the whole cool runnings thing and all that. So uh, coming up in just a couple of days is the big E3 uh, conference, convention, whatever you want to call it, the video game uh, event. Uh, it's happening out in Los Angeles, and uh, Disney will have a, a big presence there. Certainly, they're planning on having a big Disney Infinity-themed uh, booth there with a lot of uh, really uh, exciting uh, exhibits and demos of the game and some interactive things. And uh, I'm going to be sending uh, Jeremiah and Josh Dawes out there to cover it for us, so uh, definitely check back to Inside the Magic.net a little bit later this week to see what Disney's uh, uh, involvement in E3 is all about. But already, uh, there has been quite a lot of video game news this week leading up to E3, starting with uh, DuckTales Remastered. 
Remastered. Uh, it's definitely a game that I am looking forward to greatly from Capcom, where they're taking the old uh, 8-bit Nintendo game, uh, giving it you know new graphics, HD graphics, completely redrawn, a new soundtrack, uh, voices, etc., etc. We've talked about it on the show before. Of course, I had somebody from Capcom here on the show, and we talked about it. Uh, but now, uh, this week, uh, they released some new artwork, which is fantastic. It's kind of like box art, uh, even though there's not really going to be a box. Uh, it, it's uh, some great new DuckTales artwork there. They also put out uh, some gameplay videos, which you can see over on our YouTube channel, uh, showing a couple of the levels, the Amazon and Transylvania. But in addition, promoting DuckTales Remastered uh, was something really, really exciting that I am incredibly jealous that I did not, uh, I was not able to take part in this because it was out in uh, California. But uh, again, Jeremiah and Josh uh, Dawes were out there to cover this special happening, uh, an art gallery called the I Am 8-Bit Entertainment System Art Gallery in Los Angeles. As part of that, Capcom has set up a real-life Scrooge McDuck money bin. Now, it's not, you know, full-size multiple stories or anything, but it's essentially a photo op in which it uh, has a lot of plush coins with Scrooge McDuck's face on them, big oversized coins, and uh, people attending this uh, art gallery could climb inside this money bin and get a photo wearing Scrooge's hat and surrounded by the money. You couldn't swim through it. You couldn't dive, unfortunately, in there, uh, but it's still pretty awesome that they have set this up, and this is going to be... Uh, available for anyone to see out in Los Angeles for the rest of the month. Um, you know, the gallery has certain hours each day. I think I am 8bit.com is where you can find out more information or just head on over to our website. Uh, and not only you can see lots of photos and a video as well showing you what this uh, real life Scrooge McDuck's money bin is all about. It looks like a lot of fun. And the rest of the artwork is really cool too throughout this exhibit. A lot of 8-bit video game inspired artwork from, you know, Mario and Zelda and Punch-Out and all that good stuff. So uh, definitely check out uh, all of that over the website or if you're in the area go see it in person continuing with some video game news here uh, Disney Interactive announced a new game coming out in 2014 uh, coming from the same world as Walt Disney's classic music based film Fantasia this new video game is called Fantasia Music Evolved and they're calling it a musical motion video game. It's going to be coming out for Xbox One, which is going to be the new system uh, coming out next year, as well as the Kinect uh, system for Xbox 360. The game is being developed uh, from Harmonix Music Systems, who are the creators of the popular rock band series. And uh, players will create and control music and magic alongside legendary sorcerer. Yen Sid, of course. Uh, so he's making another video game appearance uh, in a, a much more detailed look than he was in the uh, Epic Mickey series. Now, you think Fantasia, you immediately think uh, classical music, you think Sorcerer's Apprentice and all of that. Well, it seems like things are going to be a little different this time around. It is called Fantasia Music Evolved for a reason, because it's going to feature more than 25 top artists and songs from today, including, I mean, I haven't even heard of half these groups before, uh, a, a song called Levels from from A-V-I-C-I-I, -I, I don't even know how you're supposed to pronounce that, uh, Bruno Mars, Locked Out of Heaven, uh, Fun, Some Nights, Kimbra, Settle Down, and then Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody is thrown in there for some reason. Um, I wouldn't exactly call that contemporary, but it is a good song. Apparently there will be some classical music in this game as you kind of work your way through these bizarre, colorful landscapes. Uh, you kind of flail around and make the music happen around you. I don't know. I don't really entirely understand it. It's going to be uh, demoed at E3 in just a few days, so I think everybody will sort of get a better idea of what this game is all about then. Um, but we'll see. You know, not everybody is thrilled with the idea of contemporary pop hits being mixed into the world of Fantasia, uh, but they do say that classical music will be in there somewhere as well. Also from Disney Interactive, a new mobile game has been released called Scribble Mix. Now, if you're a fan of Draw Something, which is uh, from another company, very, very popular uh, uh, game, this is very similar to that, but with a little bit of a twist. Scribble Mix uh, from Disney is kind of a Pictionary-style competitive game. You actually uh, uh, use phrases, existing clues, and a series of words to guess uh, other people's drawings. I mean, it sounds essentially the same thing as Draw Something, but it 
that's a little bit different. You, instead of just offering, you know, typing in the word, it's actually a phrase. So a subtle difference there. Uh, it's available for iOS and Android devices now. Windows 8 version will be on the way soon. And of course, being Disney, they've worked in uh, Monsters University characters into it for now, uh, to where you can draw those characters. Uh, in the future, they're planning on adding other Disney characters as well, with some guidelines so you can make sure to draw them and they actually look like the characters. You're not just freehanding it. Uh, the game is free, ad supported, uh, or you can pay 99 cents for it, and uh, uh, then it removes the ads from there. Now, of course, I mentioned Disney Infinity uh, just a minute ago. It's coming out in a couple of months. August 18th is the release date for that. Well, some new details on a new playset came out this week from, once again, Disney Interactive. Like I said, lots of video game news this week. The newest playset announced for Disney Infinity is none other than the Lone Ranger. It's going to have figures or figurines of, uh, of course, the Lone Ranger and Tonto, which means that's another Johnny Depp figure that'll be part of Disney Infinity. You've got Jack Sparrow, and now you've got uh, Tonto as well. And uh, as part of the gameplay in this Lone Ranger playset there will be a ricochet combat where you can hide behind things and ambush people and have uh, uh, you know shots ricocheting around corners and bouncing off pots and pans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's going to be mounts where you can ride on horses and other uh, various animals. Uh, there will be uh, trains involved and then of course in the toy box there will be all kinds of insanity going on where you'll have the Lone Ranger riding a horse again you know, syndrome in a train or something like that. Um, so uh, all of that is coming out uh, at the same time as the game. Uh, the other packs that have already been talked about, all of it is August 18th. And uh, again, they're going to be showing off a lot from Disney Infinity, a lot of new stuff uh, just coming up in a few days from uh, E3. So stay tuned for more from that. <laughs> Now in the world of movies, uh, here's a really great move uh, that Disney has done that I am very excited about. You know, you've been buying these combo packs of Blu-rays and DVDs, and they come with this extra disc, which is your digital copy. You have to stick that disc in, you get a code in the package, you put it all together, and finally you can get your digital copy of a movie off of there. Well, starting June 11th, just a couple of days from now, all of that is getting much simpler with Disney Digital Copy Plus. It's going to be starting with the launch of uh, Oz the Great and Powerful, which uh, actually I have right next to me. I have a uh, review copy that I haven't had a chance to pop in quite yet, um, but uh, as a look for a review of the, uh, the Blu-ray and 3D and all that stuff uh, pretty soon. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, soon, digital copy is going to work like this. You get a code with your purchase, and you simply head to iTunes, Amazon Instant Video, or Vudu, Put in that code, no disc required, you're downloading the movie. You don't even have to have put your disc in anywhere, in a computer, in a Blu-ray player, wherever. You can just grab your digital copy and your convenience from any of those services. Great, great idea there. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know if it's going to apply to the back catalog, unfortunately. I, I, I doubt it will. Um, but moving forward, at least, uh, that's how it's going to work. And I think that's a very good thing. Now let's talk about the D23 Expo coming up in August uh, here just a little bit because this week uh, a few items for the silent auction have been announced. There's going to be more than 70 lots in this year's D23 Expo silent auction and uh, the big, big uh, uh, piece that will be included there are a pair of Matterhorn bobsleds tandem vehicles. I guess it's not really a pair, it's just one whole car, the front and the back. These are, of course, the uh, previous vehicles that were on the track before the recent refurbishment, and as far as I'm concerned, they should just take these and put them right back on the track because the new ones are terribly bumpy, but that's beside the point. Um, so here are, uh, yeah, a chance to bid on Matterhorn bobsled uh, vehicles. There will also be a Mickey Mouse Club drum that was previously displayed at Mickey's of Glendale, at Walt Disney Imagineering. There will be uh, Siamese cats, uh, C, uh, Cy and Am, rather, uh, display pieces from Disney's Hollywood Studios. There's a 100 Mickey's pin set, a Mickey and Minnie Mouse oversized chair, and that's just a little bit of the preview that they have uh, shown so far. There'll be much more, many more items than that. Tickets are going to be, of course, $23, uh, dollars, naturally, per guest uh, to uh, uh, bid on any of these, to be part of the silent auction. It's going to take place on Saturday, August 10th, and those tickets are going to go on sale on June 11th. 
almost done with the news here. Uh, here's uh, some interesting uh, uh, hiring news that came my way this week. A man by the name of Mark Hervet, or Hervet, uh, he is uh, recently becoming, I think as of today actually, the manager of creative development resources for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts Creative Entertainment for Florida and California. I know that's kind of a mouthful, but he's apparently been a consultant with Disney for quite some time, working on uh, big events like uh, the new Fantasyland Press event, uh, the Disney Fantasy Fantasy and uh, Disney Dream Christenings, the American Idol Experience Press event, but he has also been art di- an art director with uh, Busch Gardens Tampa, Six Flags Magic Mountain, Universal Studios Hollywood, has worked on Hollow Scream and Halloween Horror Nights, and well, now he's working for Disney, so uh, definitely a, a talent that Disney has uh, hired full-time. It'll be interesting to see what he brings uh, to the table. I think he's going to be out here in Florida for a while, and then he's heading out to California. And uh, final news this week, uh, again, back to the world of uh, movies. Actually, a short is going to be debuting from Walt Disney uh, Animation Studios uh, in just a few days on June 11th at the Annecy Animation Festival in Annecy, France. And that is going to be the never-before-seen short, Get a Horse. And a poster was released just this week. It looks like a very retro poster. I think Disney is trying to build this short as if it's a really, really old uh, short film from decades and decades ago, uh, as if it's never uh, sort of surfaced until now, but I I think, if I'm reading this correctly, it is a new short, but using old sort of materials because this short is going to feature Walt Disney's own voice as the voice of Mickey Mouse, as he originally did. So, uh, I don't know, it's still very much a mystery how this is all working uh, together, if this indeed is an old short that never got finished, or if it's something new that they're just piecing together, I don't know. We'll find out soon enough uh, when it does make its debut. Uh, No word as to where it will be seen after it makes its debut in France, but I have the feeling they'll show it at the D23 Expo at some point. They'll probably put it online or put it in front of a movie or something. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, that'll do it for your news from around the world this week. This week's tip comes in from Taylor, who writes, My family and I have the uh, privilege of going to Disney all the time. However, we can't afford to go into the parks every single time we go. A good thing I think uh, your listeners should know is that there is a way to have some cheap fun over at uh, Walt Disney World. One of my favorite things to do when I go over there is to play at the Fantasia Mini Golf Golf Course uh, by the Swan and Dolphin Hotel. I'm surprised more people don't really know anything about it and thought it would be a nice heads up to people who just want to have a nice quiet day at, uh, at Disney without rushing around around in all the parks. Uh, Taylor, uh, always a great tip to remind everybody of mini golf. There's, of course, Winter Summerland as well as the uh, the Fantasia Gardens. Uh, always uh, fun. I-, I love mini golf. It's a great time. Not terribly expensive. Certainly less expensive than going to uh, the parks. And uh, definitely a great way to just uh, have some fun at Disney. Get some Disney excitement in there without uh, necessarily, you know, as you said, running around all the time and getting you know hot and sweaty and tired and all of that. So uh, there it is. Uh, everyone else Email your tips into tips at insidethemagic.net. Now, I do have a couple of uh, interviews to share that are food-related, but before we get to that, I want to talk about Capturing Magic, the pair of iPhone apps that are the ultimate tool for documenting and recording the magic of your Disney vacation, whether you're out here at Walt Disney World or in California at Disneyland. Capturing Magic offers a helpful list of photo opportunities and memories to capture before, during, and after your trip. It's the perfect way to ensure that you don't miss any of those magical moments. While you're in the parks, the app is actually going to remind you of any of those photo ops that you've picked uh, when you're near those locations. Uh, And then when you take that picture, you use the app to mark off who's in the photo, what camera you took it with, and then later you can organize everything very easily, even emailing yourself a list of all of the uh, photos that you took during your trip. The Capturing Magic iPhone apps are available now in the iTunes App Store. I 
want to take you over to France at Epcot, of course, in the World Showcase to talk a little bit about a new establishment, a new little eatery, if you will, that has opened up over there. And I'm not talking about Monsieur Paul, which I have uh, eaten at. Uh, I have not had a chance to review it quite yet. Not talking about this that this week. Not talking about the bakery either. Instead, I'm going to be talking about uh, the new ice cream uh, parlor or shop over in France. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it myself because it's in French and my French pronunciation is absolutely awful. Uh, But instead, I'm going to turn it over to uh, a man who is much better at uh, pronouncing such things because he is uh, sort of responsible for all of the wonderful food uh, that goes on not only over there, but really in the whole France Pavilion. I had a chance to talk to him uh, just a few weeks ago about uh, all this a little bit before this opened. It opened uh, just very recently, and uh, so um, well, I'm just going to let him tell you more. In fact, I'm even going to let him introduce himself. Bonjour, I'm Eric Weisshofer. I'm the general manager at uh, the French Pavilion. I take care of all the food and beverage outlet over there. Great. Um, now, my French is awful. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the upcoming ice cream and sorbet, but I'm sure you can you can handle it and tell me a little bit about it. It's going to be l'artisan glacier, the artisan ice cream and sorbet. Basically, uh, we're going to make everything on location. We're going to have 16 flavors. We're going to do 10 ice creams, 6, uh, six sorbet, and uh, all uh, fresh ingredients, some uh, milk, cream, uh, eggs, and sugar. Ba- very basic, nothing else. And then the flavor is going to be either fresh fruit or, uh, or some nuts. And uh, we're going to keep it very simple. We're going to either, you're going to choose one scoop, two scoops. It's going to be served either in a, in a cone or in a cup. And then for the adults, that's where it's most interesting one. We're going to take the martini glass, the famous martini glass from the slushies up front. And you're going to choose two flavors, either the same or mix and match. And then we're going to have some French liqueur. Of course, the Grand Marnier, the, uh, the Grey Goose. We're going to have some French rum from the island, from the Martinique. And you're going to choose one or the other, and uh, we're going to pour it on top, and it's going to be called La Rosée. So uh, we're going to say santé to that, and I think everybody's going to be enjoying it. Definitely. A little something for the kids, a little something for the adults. And, and that's going to the former bakery location, right? Exactly, to the former bakery. We uh, we just gutted everything, and it's in the process right now. We're going to try to make it a little bit more airy. Before it was very close, very small, right. so now we're going to try to keep it very airy and uh, hopefully... Uh, People are going to love it and uh, enjoy the uh, ice cream the way we do in France. Just a little bit there about uh, the ice cream shop newly opened over uh, in France at Epcot. I actually haven't even had a chance to go over there and try it myself yet, but I thought I would uh, just give you an update, let you know that it is open, and uh, it certainly sounds delicious. I'm going to have to head over there very, very soon, and uh, it is definitely better for the chef to (laughs) say all those French words than uh, for me to try it out. But we're not done talking about food there quite yet, uh, although that was rather brief. Uh, This uh, one is... uh, 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 something that I did have a chance to sample a little bit of. It tasted delicious. There's much, much more coming out of this restaurant. It's a very popular spot um, that many are looking forward to reopening. And of course, I am talking about the California Grill over at uh, the uh, Contemporary uh, Hotel out here at Walt Disney World. It has been closed for uh, for quite a while now, a number of weeks now. Going to be reopening in a couple of months uh, with a new look new menu. And you know what? I'm just going to stop there because there's no point in me talking about it when uh, again, could turn it on over to the chef who will introduce himself and uh, tell you about what is uh, to come for the California Grill. My name is Brian Pesecki. I'm the chef de cuisine of the California Grill. Okay. So the California Grill has uh, closed temporarily for a, a pretty big refurbishment. What's happening in there? What's changing? So really the entire restaurant is changing from a visual standpoint. So it's going to be incredible focus on wine, incredible focus on food. Um, Everything is being done from new kitchen equipment to new windows at the outside of the restaurant. So the entire decor will be uh, brightened and freshened, uh, really crisp, clean um, lines, uh, a lot of stainless, um, increased focus on wine. So when you come in, there'll be a controlled atmosphere, wine wall of over 2,000 bottles. You'll come around the corner and you'll see the show kitchen with its enhanced sushi case, um, as sushi will still be an integral part of the restaurant. And then seasonal, cook-to-order menu. Well, you're you're sampling some meatballs here today, and I'm standing here and I'm smelling it. It (laughs) smells wonderful. Uh, What's getting updated with the menu? So the menu will continue to have, you know, seasonal items on there. And our goal is to really take 
items that everyone is familiar with and kind of take them to the next level of sophistication. So like what we have here is a three meat meatball that's baked in a hearth oak fired oven. It's got veal, lamb, and pork, and it's a marinated pichelin olive and a Meyer lemon hinted chimichurri. Is it a particular sort of style of cuisine, uh, or is it you know ranging a, a lot of different um, you know sort of places around the world? It's going to range from everywhere around the world. You know, we have that Pacific Rim orientation in California cuisine, right. and then all the sustainability and the farm fresh produce that we have. So we're going to capture a lot of those flavors in many of the dishes. What was the reason for the the refresh? Well, California Grill has been open almost 19 years, so it was really time to keep that restaurant fresh, keep it exciting, keep it hip, and keep that energy level of what California Grill has always been about. Well, it's definitely a, a fan favorite. People have been raving about it for years, so I'm sure the new uh, food and, and the wine offerings and everything will be excellent. Uh, when can guests expect it to uh, be reopening? Well, our official opening will be in late summer 2013, so we're hope hopeful that it will be around the first two weeks of September. And there you have it, a little bit about uh, what's to come in the California Grill. Uh, I did, uh, after that interview concluded, uh, try uh, one of those uh, delicious three meat meatballs, and that alone made me want to uh, rush over to the restaurant as soon as it does reopen. I uh, have eaten there in the past. It was delicious. I expect no different. Just a new menu, new look. Uh, looking forward to that opening up in a couple of weeks. So uh, just a little bit of food fun here on uh, on this week's show. Hi Ricky. Hi Ricky. Hey Ricky. Hi Ricky. Hi Ricky. Hey Ricky. Ricky, this is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Inside the magic listener feedback. So for weeks and weeks and weeks now, I've been uh, promising we'd do some listener feedback catch-up because the emails have just been piling up. Uh, and so here we are. This is the week uh, with very little happening uh, over the last week after so very much happening in weeks prior. Uh, an insane amount of things have been going on, and there is more to come in the next couple of weeks. Some more openings, some more special events, etc. Uh, somehow this week just, just existed. Not, not too much going on. So uh, here we are. Only half an hour into the show, which leaves us about half an hour uh, to get through all this listener feedback. If it ends up being less, then, well, that'll be the end of the show. So, let's uh, jump right into it here and start casually working our way through some of these emails. And hopefully uh, sharing uh, what others have asked and commented on will also uh, spark some new ideas and new thoughts of your own while uh, listening to it. So, uh, Matt writes in and says, Me and my wife love the show. It really keeps us connected to Orlando, even though... We live far from Walt Disney World. I have a question regarding the Disney Dream. Do you have any favorite dishes in all three rotation uh, restaurants, Palo and or Pirate Night? We are going on a four-night cruise in June for our honeymoon. Don't want to miss any of the must-tries. Also, did you have any experience with the photo system on board? I hear it's kind of like PhotoPass. Well, I, I think I actually responded to uh, Matt uh, via email previously because I knew it was sort of a, a time-sensitive thing that he was going on his honeymoon in June. But here we are. I definitely wanted to share this answer with everybody else. And I know I promised a report for my recent uh, uh, cruise on the Disney Dream. That's still going to happen at some point. Um, but just to kind of make this in brief, I'll say that uh, the dining aboard the Disney Dream on this previous uh, trip, rather rather than, you know, in comparison to the uh, the christening cruise or the inaugural cruise that I went on previously, the food was so very much better. It definitely has improved over time. Uh, you know, I'm sure all the staff and, you know, the chefs, the cooks, the uh, wait staff, everybody had to sort of hit their groove. And uh, for the most most part, the food was very good. Um, as far as the uh, rotations, I didn't hit everything. I was there uh, only on a four-night cruise, so didn't have a chance to go to everything. I went to Palo. I went to Remy. Um, I went to uh, Animator's Palette. Did not go to Enchanted Garden, and I did go to the uh, the Royal Palace. Some of my favorites amongst all of that, well, at, at Remy and Palo, it's easy to pick favorites because it's everything. You cannot order anything that's bad there. Palo was absolutely uh, delicious as it was uh, when I dined there previously. And Remy, that is a, a quite the experience that I will talk about on a future uh, episode because that was uh, that was a pretty amazing dining experience. Um, as far as uh, Animator's Palette, though, I really liked the uh, truffle uh, pasta per sets. I think they uh, are... Uh, that's probably one of the best uh, dishes there. There was a... I know there was a, a veal... Um, 
there as well. That was very good. Um, over at uh, Royal Palace, there was definitely a, uh, I think there was a crusted lamb that was excellent there. The souffles are always good no matter where you order them. A great dessert uh, to be had. And uh, even the escargot, if you want to be a little adventurous, it is uh, quite garlicky as it should be. And it's uh, uh, pretty good there as well. Those are just some, some brief recommendations. Unfortunately, I didn't dine at uh, Pirate Night. I know it has a special menu there, but I was, uh, I think I was in Remy on Pirate Night. So, uh, as far as the uh, the photo system on board, not quite uh, like PhotoPass. Similar, there are photographers stationed uh, here and there throughout the ship, especially when characters are around. However, it's not as simple, unfortunately, as just scanning a photo pass card and pulling up your uh, information later. They do this whole onboard photo system thing uh, where you have to go to one location and go through your photos and, you know, there's printed ones and binders. Or you can go through the computer system as well. But unfortunately, there's no, you know, it's not quite as streamlined and easy as the uh, photo pass system where you can just not worry about it and then come home and deal with it then. You really have to do it when you're on board. So uh, anyway... Moving on to the next email. Matt, thanks very much for uh, for that. Uh, next one, uh, Trey writes in. Says, uh, I was on YouTube and I came across a channel that had posted videos of extinct attractions from the parks. This took me to some times when I went to Disney as a kid in the late 90s. And I would like to share a link with you and everybody that listens or watches the show. Well, uh, you know, it's not even necessar- uh, necessary to share this specific link because YouTube is a wonderful resource in general for extinct attractions. You really just have to search for uh, any old ride, any old show that you've been missing. Uh, most of them are on there. They're not always high quality because you know back in the 80s 90s people had those you know much larger video cameras they weren't certainly weren't hd hd didn't even exist uh years ago uh you know you had those sh- big shoulder video cameras and all of that uh, but it is nice to be able to pull up some of those older attractions and uh sort of relive those days um you know some would say even better days of being in the parks of course that's all nostalgia talking there so uh you know it's almost like a tip so thanks for that email trey molly writes in says we are trying to book dinner at Le Cellier in Canada to coordinate with the Candlelight Processional. They allow you to book at Le Cellier 180 days in advance, but they have not announced the dates or narrators yet, so it's almost impossible to choose a date for dinner. But if we don't book Le Cellier now, we, uh, it'll get booked up. So we're contemplating booking all 14 nights will be there in December. Any suggestions? Any idea when they'll announce the narrators and dates? Well, Molly, that's an interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, issue that you're running into there, and and it is very frustrating that you have to book dining so far out because it fills up, like you said, uh, and then you're worried about not being able to get in, but then it's not necessarily on the date. See, the problem is, if you do what you what you said, booking all 14 nights, you're then taking up spots for other people, and then if other people do the same thing, then there's a whole lot of spots that are taken up that you're not going to use, and then you cancel them later, and so Suddenly they open up, and it's just a big mess. I don't. I really don't like how the dining system works. I don't think you should be able to book so far in advance. Seems like a, uh, you know, a month in advance or a couple of weeks in advance or something like that would be a little bit more reasonable than half a year in advance. Uh, you know, I, I have a hard time deciding what I want for dinner tonight rather than half a year from now. But anyway, um, that aside, uh, my recommendation. I, it's t- I know you want to go to La Cellier really bad, obviously, and you want to go on a very specific night, and yes, you could book all those nights. I really wouldn't recommend doing that. I would just sit on it. I would wait for them to announce it, and then just keep trying. You'll you'll eventually get in. And I mean, you could even show up and just wait for dinner. You don't have to have a reservation. You, you know, there's always ways of getting into, uh, you know, obviously a reservation helps. It streamlines everything and all of that, but uh, I really, I make very few reservations when I travel. Uh, only if absolutely necessary. I try to just, you know, go with the flow and wing it and uh, as much as possible. And that's my style of traveling. I, I, you know, I'll book a hotel, I'll book a plane because I have to. Beyond that, you know, I, I'd rather just kind of walk up and say, hey, do you have any reservations? You know, chances are somebody's going to cancel somewhere along the line. Um, it's probably not very good advice. But uh, I, I really don't think booking two weeks worth of nights is a good way to do it because, like I said, that's really just taking up spots for other people so uh, i don't know if that helped at all but that's my answer uh next up is an email from lucy who writes uh let's see uh one of one of the episodes um i can't remember which podcast was talking about the disney half marathon uh i'm starting right in the middle of an email here okay 
We're going to skip Lucy's email for the moment just because I, it looks like I had a copy-paste problem here. Sorry, Lucy. I will make a note, and I will come back to your email. I promise. <laughs> so this is what happens when I read a lot of listener feedback uh, many weeks later. So moving on from there... Uh, Clay writes in and says, I'm catching up on old shows and just heard your bit on Grad Night at Disneyland and the alarming transition from a calm e- evening in New Orleans Square to a park-wide dance club. Hearing the music they played reminded me of a local amusement park, Six Flags Over Georgia. While I can recall them playing uh, thematically appropriate music in each section of the park, Old West, 50s Drive-In, Antebellum South, uh, for the past few years it has been swapped out for pop music nearly everywhere except for the queue for the Batman ride. It's sad that your uh, bread, bowl, and soup and a charming cafe was disturbed by the pop music but at least you get properly themed cafes and bread bowls of soup even a bad day at disney is a great day uh clay you do have a point there um yes Greta, and then we're going back several months here when i was talking about uh uh you know my little grad night timed adventure uh without me realizing that was going to be going on and uh you know grad night suddenly started i was sitting in new orleans square and you know it turned into thumping dance music from the nice jazzy music anyway uh yeah you're right uh, disney certainly has uh you know the music around disney's parks one of the best parts about being in the parks is just sitting around hearing that music to get it interrupted by grad night not so great but at least you're right it it was going on uh uh, properly during the day and every day and that is a good thing certainly a plus over some of the other parks out there Here's a little bit of a longer email that came in from Anna Chris from Mexico, who writes, I love your podcast. It's my little break of the week. I wanted to share with you some internet-related reactions to Pixar's movie based on Dia de los Muertos. The news, as I understand it, uh, was that Walt Disney Company tried to buy the intellectual rights for this Mexican holiday in order to name their new movie this way and use it as a marketing strategy. The news was received with a lot of indignation, especially from the Mexican community. Consequently, a petition started to circle through the internet to stop Disney from buying out a holiday. As you can imagine, it went viral, and finally the attempt to buy these rights was ended. First of all, I want to say that I am a Mexican and a huge fan of Disney, uh, Pixar, uh, movies, theme parks, merchandise, etc. And I want to let everyone know the reason behind the indignation of the action uh, by the Disney company Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead, is celebrated every 2nd of November, and it is a very beloved and unique holiday. We remember our loved ones and have departed uh, that have departed by uh, constructing altars that contain favorite foods and belongings of the person that has passed away. The reason behind this is that we believe their spirits will make a kind of pit stop. Uh, at their altar to re-energize themselves before continuing their journey to the beyond. We also eat a special sweet bread called pan de muerto, uh, drink hot chocolate, and make funny sugar skulls. The celebration is unique and is a very Mexican tradition, thus the idea that an American company wanted to buy this holiday and use it to sell more merchandise is really un- in- uh, unconceivable or inconceivable. Uh, I am not saying that uh, Pixar won't make a very good movie. They usually do their research and would include all the elements of our holiday and help us promote it, but how would you feel if a foreign movie company wanted to buy the rights of Thanksgiving? As a community, we are just trying to protect our traditions, but I really would like to know what you think. Uh, well, uh, it's definitely one, an issue. I didn't even really talk about this on the show very much because I thought it was entirely silly. Um, Disney certainly was not trying to buy the holiday. They weren't trying to trademark the holiday. They weren't trying to take over the holiday. It would be like, you know, they made prep and landing. This wasn't Pixar, but Disney Animation made prep and landing and as if they trademarked Christmas. You can't do that. They know you can't do that. What they were trying to do is create a word mark, essentially. You know, the name Dia de los Muertos, if they were going to call the movie that, which they're not anymore. Uh, if they were, however, they really would need to trademark that and written in a certain style and for use on products, etc., etc. They wouldn't be restricting anybody from ever using that phrase just in relation to this specific movie with this specific characters with, you know, perhaps a certain logo or a certain color or font or whatever. Um... That's really where they were going with that, and they thought, you know, calling the movie Dia de los Muertos would be no different than maybe calling a movie Thanksgiving, like you said, in which case they would have to go through certain, you know, whatever. Anyway, they realized it was a very dumb idea very quickly, and uh, they are going to be calling the movie something else. It's certainly uh, understandable the uh, outrage that came around it, especially as it got blown way, way out of proportion. I'm sure Disney never wanted to uh, take over this Mexican tradition by any means. They have included it in attractions before. It's in the uh, boat ride over 
in the Mexico Pavilion uh, over at Epcot, of course. Um, you know, there are the skulls and the celebration and all of that there. They, they are well aware of what the holiday is. Um, you know, I, I think the movie's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to it. I was a big fan of, uh, you know, LucasArts' Grim Fandango game, which was set amidst that whole world and put a spin on it. And I can't wait to see what Pixar's spin on the holiday is. Um, so my opinion is that everybody was overreacting, essentially, and uh, Disney had to backtrack a little bit and be like, okay, we're going to call it something else. Next email comes in from uh, Mike who writes, I know you're a fan of the Gummy Bears, which I am also. I listened to a podcast a month ago from the Animation Guild Oral Histories by Stephen Hewlett. Uh, Hewlett? Hewlett. Uh, show part one and two with David Block. He worked as an animator and producer for a time for Walt Disney Feature Animation and Walt Disney Television Animation, and he said one of his greatest accomplishments was working on the Gummy Bears, and he briefly explains working on it. Uh, also check out Alan Saslov interviews if you have the time. I believe he also worked on the Gummy Bears and the Disney Afternoon Shows. Mike, thanks very much for those. Heads up, anybody out there who wants to listen to some additional podcasts, uh, sounds like that's a good one to check out, uh, because uh, yeah, I definitely miss the Gummy Bears. We were talking about DuckTales earlier, of course. I miss every from the Disney afternoon and uh, any little ties to that is a good thing. Next email, a different Mike writes in and uh, has a few questions. Number one, uh, Mike writes, I was asked about the trash receptacle set the Disney parks. Is there any truth to the fact that some receptacles are just facades and when the trash is deposited that it goes down a chute as opposed to going into bags? I never really thought about it, but anyone uh and if anyone uh, who would know might be you number two the fully interactive meet and greet characters that were introduced at d23 had gone through some testing phases but never heard anything more about them have they been implemented in any of the parks anywhere and number three the last thing is the big headline of disabled guests being hired to get people to the front of the line has disney indicated any kind of change to this system or found any way of cracking down on this mike uh, all good questions uh number one i have never heard of a disney trash can that has any kind of a shoot that goes down in to you know a, a big trash bin or something uh you'll you can certainly see uh custodial cast members walking around and opening the trash cans and replacing the bags in fact i own two of the disney trash cans myself i have a tomorrowland one and a polynesian hotel one uh, that i got through the you know the local surplus vendors and uh those certainly have a little door that you can open you pull out the trash can you change it you put it back it's it's a trash can um so no i don't think there's any truth to that uh number two uh the interactive meet and greet characters talking mickey mouse uh etc not in the parks in any permanent way yet uh i think i mentioned last week that uh, tom staggs uh chairman of walt disney parks and resorts had mentioned that as part of my magic plus talking mickey would be uh involved would be making his i guess official debut at some point maybe later this year but uh nothing yet and number three, uh, I also mentioned recently that the Today Show had investigated that whole notion of hiring disabled guests to be quote-unquote tour guides to skip the lines. And as a result, Disney did say that they are uh, sort of reviewing their policies and all of this, whether or not it actually changes anything uh, other than just, you know, removing these specific uh, violation, uh, violating people. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but they say they're working on it. Next email comes in from Jamie, who writes, I have a uh, tip slash warning for UK listeners who participate in the uh, Disney Rewards program, where uh, buying a physical copy of a Disney DVD, Blu-ray game soundtrack will earn points that uh, allow you to get a unique or special item for free. Points expire after 12 months of inactivity. I recently discovered this after buying Wreck-It Ralph, uh, the Blu-ray, uh, for uh, a long time. I had been using uh, iTunes for Disney film buying and forgotten all about the points. They do send email reminders but recently uh, suffered from an email blackout and missed them. And then when I logged in on Monday, all six points, 600 points, uh, were gone. Luckily, I was able to contact the site uh, mods and get them uh, back as it had only been 30 days since the expiry. Uh, Jamie, good tip there. Certainly a good idea to log into your Disney Movie Rewards account every once in a while or review the latest you know, rewards that are available. Put in those codes as you buy movies and uh, make sure that your points don't disappear. 
Next email comes in from Margarita from New York who writes, Love, love, love your show. Uh, have my 10-year-old daughter hooked as well as my sister. We watch you on Mondays after work and school. Keep up the good work. My question to you is sparked from your June 2nd podcast. So, hey, this is actually a recent email. Uh, you said that you would hope uh, that Disney would make a Star Wars themed land. What type of Star Wars rides would you envision for that park? And do you think they would make a uh, theme park number five in Florida? Uh, I don't think that there's going to be a, a new theme park anytime soon. They are certainly still working, always are working on the existing parks. You know, attendance is here and there and prices are here and there. And, um, you know, they're not all equally uh, attended. And I think Disney would really want to focus on making sure that all the parks are the best that they can be before building a whole other one. I don't think there's really a need for that. Star Wars land, however, there is a need for that most definitely. Uh, and there are so many uh, attractions that would be wonderful. Um, you know, Star Tours certainly covers a lot of the things that would work really well as standalone attractions. So you couldn't really, you know, make a pod racing attraction. You couldn't really do a, an adventure to Hoth, for instance, because all of that's in Star Tours already. But you have plenty of other opportunities that are outside of that. Uh, the one that comes to mind immediately is something to do with the Millennium Falcon. I mean, just the... Uh, I can imagine having uh, sort of a facade that looks like you are walking up to the Millennium Falcon parked in some, you know, grungy spaceport somewhere... And and you board in there and you get to walk through because it's a huge ship. So you can walk through the different sort of rooms that you've seen in the movies. You know, see a little game off to the side where maybe Chewbacca's there and you can play a little game with him. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe you could train, uh, you know, with a lightsaber, with a little shooting, floating droid thingy. Um, sorry, Star Wars people. I don't know the names of all of these things. I am a fan, but not that big of a fan. Uh, and uh, eventually you'll find your way up, you know, to the cockpit. Maybe you could man one of those uh, uh, gunning, you know, little guns and shoot at TIE fighters, uh, or you could be a pilot, or you could work together and have sort of this interactive thing, or you could just sit back and let Han Solo take over and fly you around, um, you know, do the Kessel Run or whatever. Um, I, I, that, that's what comes to mind immediately. I think that is sort of the ultimate uh, adventure, you know, more jumping to light speed, of course, but having sort of the side adventures of Han Solo. And if Disney uh, goes ahead with these spin-off movies, in addition to the new trilogy that they're coming out, wouldn't that be fun if they could have tie-ins uh, to those additional spin-offs that follow individual characters? Han Solo, really underrepresented uh, in the parks. You see a little cameo of him in the Millennium Falcon in the new version of Star Tours in one of the sequences in the way in the background, but that's really it. Um, so it would be fun to play off of that and really have a more prominent role of, uh, of Han Solo. Jeb writes in and says, I watch your show constantly and was wondering if there was a possibility of a DC Comics land. Uh, one uh, in the universe Man of Steel is starting. Could go into Universal Studios Park. I could see it replacing the Marvel Land at Universal Orlando with Spider-Man being turned into a Justice League ride and Hulk being transformed into a Superman flying ride and Batman ride somewhere in there. I'm honestly a bigger fan of DC, which I know is strange because Disney is with Marvel and I'm a big Disney fan. Well, uh, Jeb, you know, I was just talking about... Uh, this with somebody uh, a couple of days ago and uh, I could definitely see eventually you know Universal's gotta let go of that Marvel area eventually I mean Disney owns Marvel it's gonna become more and more associated those two together and while Universal for the moment is kind of profiting off of that by uh, you know with all the big Marvel movies and all of that uh, the only place you can see those characters in a park is at Universal right now that's gonna change you know they're gonna be in California they're gonna be overseas the only place they're not gonna be in a Disney Disney Park is here in Orlando, and that's going to be weird for Universal. It's going to be very confusing. I think they're going to have to, you know, make a deal there somehow at some point with Disney. And at that point, what will become in that Marvel area? I think DC would be a natural transition there from one sort of comic universe to another. Um, would certainly have that great competition going on here in Orlando. If you've got Marvel over at Walt Disney World, and you've got DC over at Universal, I think that would be a lot of fun. And as you said, there's great properties that they could work with. Certainly, there are Superman rides. There are Batman rides elsewhere. Where, um, Six Flags, for instance, um, but that doesn't mean that Universal couldn't crank out some really exciting attractions as well. Do I think that's going to happen? Yeah, maybe. I think that's a, a good possibility. Next email comes in from Paul, who writes, I was wondering, with the recent Star Trek movie out, what are some of the uh, uh, attractions uh, that feature Trek in the theme parks, specifically in Orlando? I'm not sure if you are a Trek fan, but I found that Orlando has a Star Trek exhibit on International Drive. I wonder if you've been and what it's like. 
uh, and if there's any kind of a ride. If so, can you share any video or photos of the exhibit? I also would like to ask, uh, when you're at Universal Studios, uh, uh, were you around when Universal Studios had a Star Trek attraction called ST, the Adventure Home Video Experience? Both Universal Parks here in the States had this Trek attraction with Hollywood getting a better version, which legend has it, uh, a, a millionaire's son bought the set for a day to make uh, his own personal fan. Uh, sadly, all Trek fans know about the closing of Star Trek The Experience in Las Vegas. I never did make it there. Still crying about that. Um, uh, Paul, uh, I'm not a big Star Trek fan, honestly. I haven't even seen the new movies. I, I really just don't follow the world of Star Trek at all. I think maybe I've, I think I've seen maybe one or two of the old Star Trek movies, and they may have been sort of from the Next Generation era. Not really so much the old Chatner stuff. Uh, just not a big Star Trek fan. Uh, and no, there's not much Star Trek here in Orlando. You won't find it in any of the parks. Universal doesn't have any Star Trek. It's just... It's just not around. Um, and, you know, with J.J. Abrams moving on from Star Trek to Star Wars, uh, I don't really expect there to be too much Trek in the parks anytime soon. John writes in and says, I, uh, I really enjoy your show. Always listen on Sunday while washing my car. This has become such a routine that if your show does not come out on Sunday, I forget to wash my car. I really like how you give your non-biased opinion, and uh, when there is bias, you let the listeners know. I have a question about one of your opinions. Why do you think that the Seven Dwarves Mine Train Coaster will be a D ticket? I think it's going to be an E ticket, and here's why. It will be a coaster with an innovative ride vehicle. There will be advanced audio animatronics telling a classic Disney story with music. There's extensive rock work and looks like it will have an interactive queue. This sounds like an e-ticket. Am I missing something? Why would uh, an attraction like Big Thunder be considered an e-ticket and the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train Coaster be considered a D-ticket? I realize that today the attraction's uh, ticket ranking from A to E is purely opinion-based, but I'm hearing quite a few Disney fans predicting the Mine Train Coaster as a D-ticket, and I was just curious why you feel the same way. Uh, John, very good question. Uh, in my mind, uh, the difference between uh, an E and a D, you know, they're very close, but it's going to be sort of the length of the experience, the size of the experience, you know, what goes into it, how much you're going to be, you know, immersed in that world, how much of a story it tells. Um, so, you know, you look at something like uh, Expedition Everest, that would certainly be an e ticket. It is a huge mountain. It is huge. It's a big, thrilling roller coaster that does multiple things while you're riding. It used to have a really <laughs> advanced audio animatronic Yeti in it. Um, it. You know, a very elaborate cue. It tells the stories you're going through. It's pure imagination, imagineering through and through. Uh, same with Big Thunder Mountain. It sort of takes you into this world, into Frontierland. It is sort of the anchor for all of Frontierland. It's got a very long, winding uh, cue. Uh, you know, it's got some interaction stuff now, but that aside, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a thrilling sort of uh, a rite of passage almost moment where you can finally ride Big Thunder when you're old enough for that. Now, they've said uh, the Mine Coaster, the uh, Seven Doors Mine Coaster, is going to be somewhere in between the Barnstormer and, uh, and Big Thunder when it comes to thrills. I wouldn't say thrills necessarily uh, make something an E-ticket versus a D-ticket, but... Um, Looking at the construction site, looking at what they, they're building for the Seven Doors Mine Coaster, uh, sort of listening to how they have described it, looking at the track that they're installing, it just seems like it's going to be a short ride. You know, maybe it'll be a minute and a half, two minutes long. I could be wrong. If it ends up being a ride with multiple dark ride scenes, with advanced audio animatronics, uh, ends up being a three or four or five minute ride, has a lot of uh, thrills, has the unique uh, you know ride system, it really all comes together into this big sort of longer experience where start to finish from the time you walk up to the time you walk out is 20 to 30 minutes uh, worth of entertainment. Um, then I would call it an e-ticket. But if it's sort of just a, you know, you walk up, there's a little bit of a winding queue, you ride the ride and you're done, um, that's when it kind of gets bumped down. I don't know. It is very, it is very uh, you know, as you said, opinion-based. Hard to say exactly what uh, Disney would have uh, called it. Uh, but, you know, it just seems like a d-ticket to me. Well, we're getting close to the hour mark here, and I still have a lot of emails here uh, so let's just do a few more and I'll continue to, to catch up in the coming weeks next email is from Marcus who writes I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of years great podcast by the way and I was just wondering if you know if Disneyland is running out of space how uh, much bigger can they get 
after Cars Land? Would they be able to uh, uh, get new rides without closing others? Marcus, a great question there. It's uh, amazing that they built Cars Land uh, as they did. Um, it's amazing that they built California Adventure. They're always finding ways of building new things without necessarily closing other ones too much. Uh, there is, you know, there's a little bit of land here and there. There's, you know, more parking lots that they could take over, more cast member areas. Uh, you know, they could build another garage somewhere and uh, et cetera, et cetera. They do have land. Uh, you know, kind of separate all across the street where there's currently the Toy Story parking lot. Um, they have ways of building new things, certainly. It's tight. It's very, very tight out there. It's not like they have ample land like out here at Walt Disney World. If they wanted to build something big and new like Cars Land again, I think it would be very difficult. They're definitely running out of space uh, immediately surrounding both of those parks out there. But the possibility is there to, you know, sort of expand across the street or outward a little bit from the existing uh, property lines. So I, I don't think, you know, any big attractions are in danger of closing, uh, you know, and being replaced. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it just depends on what their, their ideas are. I don't, I, don't, I don't think they're planning any big new giant land expansions at the moment. Um, you know, I don't see, let's say, any room for Star Wars land to go out there, for instance. Uh, but, you know. They, they have they have their ways. That's what Imagineering does. Bobby writes in, says, I was curious. Went to see if uh, Disneyland's future plans uh, after expanding. And uh, on a website, uh, cast members said about a year ago, Disneyland was going to build a new park uh, that would go against the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal. I was wondering if you know of anything. Recently, I looked at the Little Mermaid two-disc DVD and has a preview of a different version of the ride. It has cooler scenes, and uh, the shells track was over the ride vehicle, like on Peter Pan. Why was it built differently? Uh, and last thing, do you think Marvel or Star Wars would make it into Disney Infinity? Bobby, interesting questions there. Of course, we were just talking about the expansion, or not, of Disneyland, and uh, if they're going to build a new park that goes against Wizarding World of Harry Potter, I, I don't have any idea. I think all of that would just be rumors. I'm sure there are many plans out there for Disney to sort of have their answer to uh, Harry Potter and its success for Universal. What that is, whether it's Star Wars or Marvel or something else, remains to be seen. Uh, you're right, the Little Mermaid made a ride through that was on uh, the DVD release a few years ago much better than the actual uh, dark ride that was built don't get me wrong I, I really enjoy the ride that's out in California Adventure and now out here at New Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom but there was so much more to the uh, the version that was shown off in there and I think it just comes down to space and budget and time and all of those things that you know big ideas get whittled down and that's what happens with every uh, Imagineering created attraction they, they plan for huge amazing things and then you know reality sort of sets in and they have to work with what they can so I think that's what you know happened with the Little Mermaid ride and as far as Marvel and Star Wars and the Disney Infinity I would think so eventually if they're bringing the Lone Ranger into it um, you know I, I think they'll they'll sort of work all of if, if the game is a success uh, I think they'll work all of the worlds that Disney owns and all the characters into it uh, at some point and there we are. We hit an hour for the show, so I will uh, stop the listener feedback a thon there. Uh, many more emails to share, so I'll have to do this uh, once again uh, at some point in the coming weeks when we have another slow week here. But uh, for this week, that'll do it for your listener feedback. That's where I will be ending show 427. Uh, maybe made you a little bit hungry talking about uh, the ice cream and sorbet over in France and what's to come for the California Grill. Uh, I'm looking forward to heading over to Epcot soon to try all of that. And uh, certainly the California Grill, when that reopens in a few months, I will definitely get out there to uh, take a little sampling of this and that uh, as well. Definitely a great restaurant. Uh, coming up over the next few weeks here on the show, I know it was a slow week uh, this week, uh, but there is a lot of excitement uh, certainly coming up. Uh, you know, Monsters University is going to be coming out. Not only will I be giving uh, my review of that film, which I'm really looking forward to seeing, but also going to be talking to uh, somebody who worked on the film from Pixar, so uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, of course, uh, Transformers The Ride 3D going to be officially opening out here in Orlando. Uh, really looking forward to the grand opening of that. Uh, about a week and a half 
half from now. And then we'll be moving into the summer season, which uh, at the world of theme parks usually means that there's not a whole lot new, uh, you know, not a whole lot of uh, uh, things uh, sort of happening that are other than the day-to-day routine because the crowds are so heavy and certainly out here in Florida it's very hot and it's just a matter of uh, you know taking it uh, week by week uh, day by day and just kind of going through uh, the normal routine of the parks but of course uh, limited time magic is going on as well so we'll see what happens throughout the summer on all of that so lots to uh, look forward to certainly as the summer months uh, uh, come and go and then I'm really looking forward to fall because that's my favorite time of the year Uh, summer is usually when I don't go to the parks that much because it is hot and crowded, but I'm sure I'll find plenty of reasons to go uh, over the next couple of months. Anyway, I do want to thank, uh, of course, Magic, uh, um, excuse me, Magical Travel for sponsoring this week's episode of Inside the Magic. You can find out more about their services by visiting MagicalTravel.com. Also, check out the Capturing Magic apps over in the iTunes store if you want to do a good job and do everything you can to capture those magical moments when you are in the Disney parks and uh that's about it for this week of course between episodes of the show visit inside the magic.net it is your source for all disney and theme park news and a whole lot more fun so thanks to all of you for listening and for watching each and every week have a magical week bye